You learn two things in detective school. First, always keep your files neat and orderly. And second, a case that involves a missing blonde will inevitably drive you to drink. Still, something about this case intrigued me. Besides, I was between clients at the time, and certain bill collectors were starting to get ugly. The papers said she was last seen in Durhatchet Hollow, walking her chihuahua through a nearby graveyard. Not much to go on, but I had to start somewhere. Ed, there's a gentleman out here to see you that looks like he wants money. Do you want me to show him in, or do you want to go out the window again? He wanted money, all right, you, but Spencer. it was for a good cause. All proceeds go to the orphanage and are, of course, tax deductible. I don't mean to pry, but your secretary mentioned that you might be driving out to Durhatchet Hollow tonight. It's a very evil place. I want you to have this. It may save your life. It's a vial of holy water. Twelve dollars. Tax deductible. Take a hike, sweetheart. He wanted money, all right. Inspector, Mr. Vasilini wants to give you five good reasons why you should pay him the money tonight. As I slowly regained consciousness, I was touched by my secretary's concern. Ed, are you all right? Poor kid was crazy about me. Don't you think you ought to start looking for that girl? I mean, I'd like to get paid this week too, you know. The Durhatchet Institute was founded by a Nobel Prize-winning scientist who disappeared in the late 50s, leaving the place deserted for nearly 30 years. I walked up the creaking front steps and turned the knob. Locked. I got the answer one might expect from an empty house. Silence. As I walked around the house, I saw an open window high above me. A little further along, I found a ladder leaning next to another window. The grounds around the Institute were dense and overgrown. One could easily get lost in these woods. Within moments, I realized I was lost in the woods. Still lost, I have no idea where I am. wandering aimlessly. At long last, I saw the Institute in the distance through the trees, and in the other direction, what appeared to be a cemetery. The graveyard was quiet. I decided to act like the scriptwriter and go in search of a plot. 
I found the marker for the Durhatchet family tomb. I ran as fast as I could towards Durhatchet Manor. I spotted a rotted chest in the bushes but had no time to stop. Naturally, there was a key that fit the front door under the mat. The stench was awful. It was like entering a tomb. There were rotting stairs to my right and a room to my left, and I felt a cold chill on the back of my neck. I whirled about in time to see the wind slam the door shut. Then I realized I wasn't alone. I bid a fond farewell to the fanged femme fatale and ran up the stairs. I paused to see if I was being followed. I was. Her skin erupted as the water splashed onto her. The stench was awful. The second floor looked dark and uninviting. My fear faded as I fled. I felt fine till I fell. So I flipped over and found I'd been followed by a fanged femme fatale with a fried finger. I hated to be rude, but sometimes you got no choice. As I stood up, a strange mist started to come in from under the door. The only other door led to a closet. I hesitated before entering the closet. Was I a man or a mouse? I decided to give it serious consideration from inside the closet. In the darkness, I became aware of something gnawing on my ankle. So I switched on the light. Rats! I turned on the light and discovered a stairway. The stairs led to an attic. A trail of green ooze leading off to my left. And in the other direction, piles of old junk near an open window. The slime led to a glowing crystal sphere next to a rotting, slime-covered pirate chest. As I gazed into the sphere, I saw a piece of garlic, followed by a mouth only an orthodontist could love. I opened the stinking, rotted pirate chest and discovered, naturally, a stinking, rotted pirate. Knife in one hand, small wooden box in the other. I 
I reached for it, but I wasn't quick enough. While I struggled to keep the pirate down, I was also struggling to keep my lunch down, and not doing well in either department. The moment I touched the box, the pirates started to laugh. Then he shook his head and disappeared. I slammed the lid down. Despite the open window, the attic smelled musty. The smell seemed to be coming from a large wooden crate. Then I saw it, and vice versa. Whatever it was flew at my head and knocked me to the ground. It looked angry. I pushed it away and looked for a weapon. I grabbed the bat with both hands and swung it away from me. To say it looked angry would be a gross understatement. I grabbed the rope and a trap door opened. I fell for what seemed to be a long, long time and hit the ground hard. <clears throat> Fortunately, I broke my fall on something soft. Well? Well, what do you think you're doing? Mother doesn't like anybody playing in her laundry. Do ya, Mom? That's right, stay out of my laundry! Why don't you run up those stairs where the butler's been nice enough to hold the elevator for you? I'm just a frail old lady who is... That's right, you heard her. This guy was obviously a psycho. On the steps above me, a green ghoul gestured gracefully. I approached the zombie reluctantly and asked him who his tailor was. His response was to push me backwards into a rickety old freight elevator. What floor, please? First floor, everybody out. Watch the door. We arrived on the first floor and I got off. The room was crawling with vermin. It was one of Vasolini's boys. Inspector, ah, you're a hard man to locate. Secretary told me I could find you here. Time's up, Gumshoe. Mr. Vasolini's authorized me to pick up an all outstanding home improvement role. I wondered if I should warn him. Whatever it was behind him, got him.
I grabbed the gun and ran into the next room. The next room I came to had nothing in it but a bottle of clear liquid. Suddenly, the wall started tumbling down. Smashing through the wall was my buddy, the gangster. Now some kind of zombie. I struck a match and tossed it his way. That seemed to discourage him. Everyone knows you shouldn't stand in a room that's filling with smoke. I felt pretty stupid as I blacked out. I don't know how long I was out, but someone or something had dragged me to a cellar below Derhatchet Manor. As I struggled to clear my head, I clicked on my flashlight and looked around. Any fool could see that the place had more than its share of dingbats, and I was no exception. It was there, in the cellar, that I discovered the little man with the evil grin. I've informed the Count of your arrival. He insists that you stay for dinner! <laughs> Would you like that, people? <laughs> He fell for it, so I took the opportunity to bash him in the chops. I never hit a man when he's down, but I knew I should have made an exception when I felt his fingers on my throat. I flipped him into his coal bin and ran into the darkness. I wandered into what looked like an ancient Egyptian low-rent housing project. I could make out curse, ham, honor, I. The curse of ham on rye. When I turned to leave, I saw someone blocking the door. Obviously, the tomb's present resident. Just then, I spotted a prowler at the window. I hid behind a bush and watched him ransack the tomb. Apparently, the basket had a curse on it. The curse of Ham on Rye. I watched in silence as the basket was filled with jewels by the mummy of Ham on Rye, who nearly got grilled in the process.
While the mummy watched from the doorway, I examined the contents of the basket. Another booby trap. I took the scroll and started to unroll it. A fungus started to form on my hand. It turned out that the scroll was nothing more or less than the credits for this low-budget picture. The curse, however, was real. I removed the jewels and left the room. On the steps above me, a green ghoul gestured gracefully. I approached the zombie reluctantly and asked him who his tailor was. His response was to push me backwards into a rickety old freight elevator. What floor, please? First floor, everybody out. Watch the door. We arrived on the first floor and I got off. The room was crawling with vermin. It was one of Vasolini's boys. Ah, Spectre! You're a hard man to locate. The secretary told me I could find you here. Time's up, gumshoe! Mr. Vasolini's authorized me to pick up on all outstanding home improvement. I wondered if I should warn him. Whatever it was behind him, got him. I grabbed the gun and ran into the next room. The next room I came to had nothing in it but a bottle of clear liquid. Suddenly, the walls started tumbling down. Smashing through the wall was my buddy, the gangster. Now some kind of zombie. I struck a match and tossed it his way. That seemed to discourage him. The next room I came to had nothing in it. There was an old freezer on one side and a wall full of potions on the other. Just as I started to examine them, I heard a scream. I read the labels, extra strength potion, instant steak pill, anti-grav tablets.
I wasn't hungry now, but an instant steak might come in handy later. Anti-grav tablets. I noticed something strange from the moment I opened the jar. Taking the extra strength potion seemed like a good idea, till I read the fine print. Ignoring the fumes, I opened the freezer. Only to find another prisoner of this horrible place. Oh, fire out, man. Thank you very much. You're a beautiful bird. No, that's okay. I'm cool. Man, I thought I was going to be stuck in here forever, man. There are some crazy people running around this house, man. A couple of chicks you got to watch out for. Um... You know, if today's Thursday, I gotta be at a Jefferson Airplane concert on Thursday. Well, I gotta get to my brother's house. He lives in Fresno. Um, you wouldn't have a car by any chance. You wouldn't be going near Fresno area. Uh, Fresno's really not that far. Uh, who put this tag on my foot? He you was, unfortunately, an obnoxious jerk who didn't have anything money. intelligent to offer. You want money or a cigarette? What are you, crazy? I mean, I couldn't get out of this box. How am I supposed to know how to get out of the house? Uh, no, no, man, don't. Don't leave, man. Look, I just give me five bucks, man. Five bucks will give me my sister's house, and I'll leave you alone, I swear. He let just you wouldn't okay. let me go. I gave him five dollars and left. As I ran into the next room, I heard the scream again. Returning to the hall, I glanced up to where the sound came from. <laughs> the Looney Tune was thrashing about wildly, so I backed up and gave him plenty of room. He fell on his head. I ran through the door and found myself near the elevator. I pushed the button and waited. There was a green door to my left and a stairway to my right. At the top of the stairs, I saw an ugly dwarf. This is the master's private property. But it's my job to see that it remains private. Private eye versus private Igor, eh? When he moved, I jumped over the railing. <clears throat> it was a long way to the first floor, and Laughing Boy was no help at all. I grabbed his shirt and he flipped over the railing. <laughs> the second floor looked dark and uninviting.
The room I next entered was obviously a library of some sort. There was a door to my left, another dead ahead, but most of the action was taking place in the kitchen on my right, where someone was practicing a bizarre form of culinary preparation. Someone had left a fire burning. The room was dark, so I lifted the shade to allow some moonlight to filter in. Vladimir told me I would not be disturbed. I suppose an evening of intellectual stimulation tucked away from that dog-eat-dog -dog world is simply too much to ask. I stepped forward, fully intending to teach him some manners. But you know what they say about teaching an old dog new tricks. Once back in the library, I glanced back. It seemed to be waiting for me to do something. I grabbed a stick and whistled a few times. I tossed it into a closet and slammed the door shut. I couldn't put my finger on it, but there was something odd about the woman in the kitchen. I think maybe it was her three-day beard. Inside the cupboard was a rose, a clove of garlic, and a couple of potatoes. I reached in and grabbed the rose. I tiptoed out of the kitchen and left her to her work. A faint breeze carried a musty odor to my sensitive nostrils. This room seemed to be a lavatory. There was something odd about it, and then I realized what it was. The room smelled like wet dog. Suddenly, I realized that someone was coming up behind me. Thinking quickly, I stepped into the shower and pulled the curtain closed. A hairy paw reached in and turned on the water. I peered around the corner and saw a she-wolf busily primping herself for a night on the town. I whistled. She turned and giggled like a schoolgirl. Then she started towards me. I grabbed the newspaper and smacked her on the nose. He apparently had never been to obedience school. I woke up with the feeling that I was at the end of my rope. When I realized that I was, I was fit to be tied. The situation was bad and my life hung in the balance. But this was no time for reflection. Ah, Mr. Spectre. Did you have a nice nap? 
I'm so glad you've decided to hang around. <laughs> well, the only reason why you're alive is because the master prefers a hot lunch to cold cuts. I was trying to think of a diversion when I lost my footing. The whole world started to slip away as the rope bit into my neck. When I got up, I saw that the pipe had made quite an impression on Laughing Boy. I told Laughing Boy he was bound to be out of circulation for a while, but he didn't appreciate the gag. The next room contained an old writing desk under the Durhatchet family crest. On the desk were many items of interest. Just as I picked up the papers, the candle lit itself, and a funky phantom friar floated into the room. As the parchment went up in smoke, likewise did the phantom. What floor, please? The second floor looked dark and uninviting. The room I next entered was obviously a library of some sort. There was a door to my left, another dead ahead, but most of the action was taking place in the kitchen on my right, where someone was practicing a bizarre form of culinary preparation. I couldn't put my finger on it, but there was something odd about the woman in the kitchen. Well, if you're hungry, get it yourself! There ain't no room service in this hotel! I think maybe it was her three-day beard. Inside the cupboard was a rose, a clove of garlic, and a couple of potatoes. I reached in and took the clove of garlic. What do I now? You're spoiling your appetite! I tiptoed out of the kitchen and left her to her work. A faint breeze carried a musty odor to my sensitive nostrils. This room seemed to be a lavatory. 
there was something odd about it. And then I realized what it was. The room smelled like wet dog. Suddenly, I realized that someone was coming up behind me. Thinking quickly, I stepped into the shower and pulled the curtain closed. A hairy paw reached in and turned on the water. I peered around the corner and saw a she-wolf busily primping herself for a night on the town. I whistled. She turned and giggled like a schoolgirl. Then she started towards me. She leaned forward and planted a wet, sloppy kiss on my lips, then stepped aside to let me pass. I stopped for a moment near the doorway to pick up a playing card for good luck. I rounded the corner and very nearly bumped into a female vampire. She was just starting to leave when I gave myself away. I hid, made a noise like a rat, and when I re-entered the room it was empty. There was a closet in the corner with doors on either side of it. I opened the double doors and ducked as a broken down bed bounced into the room. She rose from the bed like smoke from the burning book. I yanked the sheet from under her feet and cracked her head as she fell off the bed. Eat your heart out, Mother Goose. I opened the closet door and hurried in. A moment later, I was in another hallway. I was reaching for the door handle when suddenly... The one you seek is in that room, but she won't be living with you. Do you want to know why? Because of the inherent power of the vampire over the inferior human will. Then she smiled, revealing teeth that would look more at home on a wolverine. When she grabbed me, I grabbed my hat. As soon as I entered the room, I saw the girl on the bed. I had to move fast. The hat trick wouldn't buy me much time. Where I was told there's a woman so cold that a snow-beaten heart cannot break. To love you tonight while the full moon is bright. I hid behind the curtain and watched in horror as the room filled with female vampires.
When they looked my way, my reaction was instantaneous. I pulled the curtain down and used it to diffuse their bloodlust. I grabbed my hat and got out the way I got in. In my haste to escape, I managed to trip over the bed. They burst into the room. I remained where I was till the last possible second, then jumped up, grabbed the bed, and flung it into the wall. The fire from the book had spread to the walls. I backed out of the room. I called the elevator and got right in when it arrived. I stumbled into some kind of witch's coven. Best not stick around, cutie. Morbius not playing with a full deck tonight. <laughs> I pulled the card out of my pocket. The witches seemed pleased. Thanks to you, Morbius now playing with a full deck. We are in your debt. But do not try our patience. I will tell of the unbridled wickedness of Count Vladimir Yorchikonsky. If I tell your fortune, the debt will be paid. The Count is the true master of this house. To oppose him is to gamble with your life. Pick a card. I picked a card. She didn't seem happy. Luck is on your side, mortal. This much I will tell. A steak is the only thing the Count finds hard to swallow. <laughs> now go! There was some kind of laboratory just ahead. I had no idea which way to turn. When I called the elevator, I noticed a green ooze coming from the rafters above. I thought I heard someone coming. I tried to hide. No sense trying to hide, Mr. Spectre. I am Baron Otto der Hatchet, and your name is Mud. We have ways of dealing with trespassers here. What could I do? He had a gun. Think fast, Gumshoe. You take three trips on a merry-go-round and grab seven rings each trip. What do you get? A difficult question.
very good. I could use a brain like yours in my latest experiments. Have a seat, Mr. Spectre. I had little choice. He was carrying a gun. I said, sit down. The chair looked comfy, so I sat down. The chair strapped me in automatically. In just a few minutes, your brain will be occupying that massive body. Does the concept appeal to you? Was he kidding or what? Missing girl? No, I... I think you probably want to talk to my cousin, Count Vladimir Yorchakonsky. You know, if he hadn't persuaded me years ago to have a, a simple brain operation, I, I probably still would be working for the good of mankind in hangnail research. Baron Der Hatchet was nutty as a fruitcake. No matter. Let the experiment begin! <laughs> It's hard to describe what happened next. Imagine a half ton of moldy pizza coming to life before your very eyes. If I lived through this, I was going to need a new suit. Angry monster ripped me from my bonds and yanked me from my chair. <laughs> While the monster giggled, the lab continued to fill with smoke. I looked around for a means of escape. A sledgehammer sat on a ledge below a gas mask in the corner. I couldn't budge it, but Larry Lugnut hoisted the huge hammer without popping a stitch. The machine looked ready to explode. I hadn't a moment to lose. I clambered out the open window as fast as I could. The ladder beside the window led to the roof. I stepped onto the roof and looked back. I had been followed. The creature advanced and I retreated, with dignity, till I felt his icy hand on my ankle. I gave him a taste of my shoe leather. Then I ran up the rooftop till I saw what lie ahead of me. I was definitely in trouble. I ran and jumped and grabbed the gutter to prevent a three-story drop. There was a window in front of me just beyond my reach.
I tumbled through the window and fell hard. Someone or something was sitting across the attic from me. Ah, at long last, the detective decides to pay a visit to his host. Have you enjoyed our hospitality so far? <laughs> it was difficult not to listen. His voice had a strong hypnotic effect. You don't know me, but I know you. Each time you lapse in consciousness, I get to know you a little better. Come sit, drink with me. It's something I picked out close to your heart. That was my blood he was sucking on. What makes you think I know where she is? Did you visit the hatchet before coming to see me? Always count your chickenski before their hatchet! My throat! Oh no! I couldn't believe it. Was he really dead? I lit a match to help things along. You fool! I found things! I found things! Ow! Ow! Count your Chukunsky was history, and I'd be in the same boat if I didn't haul ashes in a hurry. I pried the window open and jumped through. I think I sprained my ankle in the fall. I was running through the woods when I spotted my secretary up ahead. Would she be glad to see me? She was crazy about me, poor kid. Sorry, Ed. But you've got to learn not to sneak up on people like that. Where have you been? I've been looking all over for you to let you know you can stop looking for that rich kid. <laughs> Seems she wasn't missing after all. Her parents just never thought to look in her bedroom. Are you okay, Ed? You don't look so good. It had not been what I would call a typical case, and, to be honest, there were a few times when I thought I wouldn't make it. But good triumphed over evil, and young girls everywhere could once again sleep late in their bedrooms. Case closed.